Hello, dear listener. Cherie here, host and producer of Strides Forward. Before we get on to this episode, I wanted to tell you about another podcast I think you'd enjoy. It's called She Runs Trails, and it was created to give voice to female mid-pack and back-of-the-pack trail runners who are doing incredible things out on the trail every single day. She Runs Trails is ideal for newer and veteran trail runners alike, as well as trail-curious road runners. Hosted by Melody Downlearn, who did not find trail running until age 40, this podcast covers a range of issues from nutrition, gear, ultra running, and mental health. Check out She Runs Trails podcast the next time you go for a run, or you can find Melody's latest book, The Beginner's Guide to Successful Trail Running, at SheRunsTrails.com. Okay, now on to the episode. Strides forward. 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 Welcome back to Strides Forward, the podcast of stories about women and running, told one woman at a time. I am Cherie Louise Turner, your host and producer. In this episode, you'll hear the story of a South African running legend who has a strong understanding of how running can be a vehicle for change, inspiration, and self-empowerment. My name is Blanche Moyler, and I'm from Durban, which is on the East Coast in our beautiful country in South Africa. I'm sure you notice there's quite a bit of noise in the background here, and what you're hearing is the 2019 Comrades Marathon Race Expo, where I met up with Blanche. And while it wasn't an ideal recording environment, it is relevant. For starters, the theme of this season is experiences in and around the Comrades Marathon, a 90-kilometer or roughly 56-mile road race that takes place each year in South Africa. Comrades turns 100 years old in 2021, and over 27,000 runners have registered for the 2020 event. This makes it the oldest and largest ultra-distance foot race in the world. Meeting Blanche in this environment drove home the fact that she is enormously popular. Race expos are where racers check in and pick up their numbers, and it's where there are booths for all types of products, services, and organizations related to running or to the event at hand. With big races like Comrades, the expos are open for a couple of days leading up to the event, and they buzz with excitement and anticipation. It's a time to connect with fellow runners and maybe show your appreciation to or get a selfie with your favorite running star or running legend, like Blanche. In this environment, she doesn't get very far very fast. Walking through this today was also overwhelming, the, the Comrades Expo. Lots and lots of people came up to me to tell me how I've influenced them to take up running. And this comes from other provinces, Johannesburg, Cape Town, and, and so forth. So to me, that's just so humbling to then know that I've made a difference in others' lives. As Blanche alluded to there, South Africa is divided into provinces, like Canada, as opposed to someplace like the U.S., where the country is divided into states. And Blanche mentioning that she gets accolades from people in all the different provinces points to, yes, the fact that she's well-known throughout South Africa. This widespread popularity has to do with the work she does and her many running accomplishments. She's run comrades many times, but before that, in the 80s and early 90s, she was one of the country's top runners, but in races that were much shorter than 90 kilometers. Blanche has set records and won over 50 races, including many national titles, competing in distances from 1,500 meters to the marathon, as well as cross country, and she's received numerous awards. This nationwide support of Blanche, however, it wasn't always so forthcoming. She faced many hurdles in her legendary journey, and I will get to all of that. But here, we'll start in the now with the work Blanche is known for these days, work that is outside of her job of being a psychiatric nurse. And some of that work that she does is tied to why I met her at the expo. She was there volunteering at one of the booths because she doesn't run comrades just for herself. I run for an organization called the Hillcrest Aid Center Trust. They um, 
look after, or should I say, um, assist people who are affected and infected by eggs. So we have children who have been often, they might be healthy, but they often because their parents are no more because of AIDS. And, uh, oh, and they also look after patients. They've got a hospice. They, they've got so many interesting projects, uh, very holistic, but it's the whole community involved. Blanche is also well known for her public speaking, mentoring, and outreach. Well, um, I do go to schools a lot. I go to community centers, and I speak to women, and especially women and, and, and girl, the, the girl child. Although at school, obviously, I've got the boys in there as well, um, but I focus a lot of my attention on empowering women. And right now, I've got about 13 personally under my wing that I assist with lifestyle skills and um, also their athletics, um, a bit of coaching there and so forth. I've always believed in that I'd like to give back to the communities. I've, I've really achieved so much through my running. And yes, Blanche is known at Comrades because as of completing the race in 2019, she's run it 16 times. And in 2004, she was the face of Comrades, her image was used to promote the race. Mind you, Blanche is now in her 60s, so her longevity and discipline here are noteworthy. And not to be glossed over, there's a world of difference between being the fastest athlete over shorter distances, like she was in her youth, and sustaining a 90 kilometer effort year after year into what are conventionally considered one's retirement years. All this is to say that Blanche is widely admired across many facets of the sport and over many decades. One quick side note, as we're touching on distances, you may have noticed that this event is called the Comrades Marathon, but that it is not a marathon in the conventional sense of the word. In almost all cases, when someone is referring to a marathon, they're talking about an event that's 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers long. Anything longer than that is considered an ultra marathon or an ultra. The Comrades Marathon is an exception in this regard because it is actually an ultra marathon. In each episode, in addition to telling one runner's story, I'll provide some extra information about the race. For this episode, I'll cover a bit of the history of Comrades, how it started and some of the milestones, especially as those pertain to female runners. Now back to our story and where it all began. Blanche started testing her leg speed when she was quite young. Running was one way her parents got her and her six siblings to do tasks outside the home, motivated by a homemade timer. The timing started with her mother spitting on a rock outside the front door. We did a lot of running at home as a family, just about three or four kilometers between errands. <laughs> but you come back before the saliva is dry. <laughs> you had to be quick. And we were little. Now that easily could have been the end of Blanche's running pursuits. She was, by her own description, shy and studious, often likely to be found alone in her room reading. Besides, girls weren't encouraged to run. But it very well may have been all that racing around as a child that helped Blanche develop the smooth and efficient running style that got noticed one day when she was in her early 20s. While working as a student nurse, Blanche participated in a hospital sports day. A doctor who worked at the hospital noticed her good running form, and he encouraged her to join him for training runs. After some initially painful outings, Blanche began to enjoy the way running made her feel. It gave her confidence and a belief in her ability to achieve. And when her training friend encouraged her to enter a local 10K race, she did, coming in third. Blanche realized she had a talent for running fast, but she was also female. Yeah, you know, um, my community is very conservative, yes. And of course, the dress code was a problem for running. But my uh, immediate family were very, uh, they were understanding that you can't wear in the tracksuit. You expected to run in a tracksuit bottom to compete. 
but I ran in shorts and that was acceptable to my immediate family. With that support, I, I was able to keep my head up and, and, and run. And to me, uh, morality is not about your outward appearance, it comes from within. And that's what I was trying to tell those who questioned my dress code, you know, that it's about the inner me, not what you see outside. And, and you've got to run in a tire that is competition friendly. Blanche backed up her insistence on looking like a competitive athlete with the training and determination required to become a seriously competitive athlete. And then in 81, I won my first national title. And uh, that's when people started taking notice that, um, yeah, there was something in my running, you know. And my community got great support from them. So when they started seeing me win and run well, the support came uh, because I was putting my community, um, you know, highlighting the, the, the strengths of my community. And yeah, I, I just got the support big time. Blanche had gained the support of her own community, but now that she was on the national stage, she was getting noticed by the rest of South Africa. This was during the time of apartheid, and Blanche, to use her preferred terminology, is melanin-enriched. But from obviously the other communities, <laughs> we were living in a time of social, um, for want of a better word, diverse social stuff, and um, there were problems there, you know? So not everybody was um, appreciative of my running so well. Blanche's response to this was simple and extremely effective. Um, but needless to say, there were more positive feedback from other communities than negative. I had one or two people hurl abuse at me, but um, you know, as I've said many a times, when you are given lemons, make lemonade. And I relied on my legs to make the lemonade. And I just ran faster. And it just gave me the strength to go harder and, and, and to prove that I belong on those podiums, you know. Blanche maintained her focus on winning races, though not unaware of the contentious political and cultural climate that swirled around her. Yeah, and, and the resistance I found very petty and, and sad because what actually transpired was there were two athletes very talented, but from the other community, and their parents were really in Parliament. They were political, strong folk, and these young girls were told if they couldn't beat me, they had to quit, because they couldn't allow a brown girl to be ahead of them. That was very sad, because their career was cut short, and um, no... And, and no fault of this, it's just that we, we come from a very patriarchal society. Whether it's a brown community or a melanin deficient community, melanin deficient, melanin enriched, I, I like to use those terms rather. We have a very patriarchal society in South Africa, so these girls had to listen to their parents and quit. Because for some reason, I always had that little edge about them. Time and again, Blanche employed her well-honed ability to turn other people's negativity into her strength. Here she mentions Pretoria, the government capital of South Africa, which means that in the 80s, it was where the heart of the power structure enforcing apartheid was located. Blanche also mentions Afrikaans, which is the language spoken by white South Africans of Dutch descent. Short of being politically correct, <laughs> the 10 kilometer in 84, 1984, I won in Pretoria. And that, that was one of the races where there were some Afrikaans speaking students hurling comments at me, negative comments. And I took strength from that and ran very hard. And I think that is one of the races I'll always remember. 
that don't feel pity yourself when you get negative comments. Just run the best you can and run as hard as you can. Of course, also rely on the Almighty God, Jehovah, to give you the strength to, to overcome this negativeness. A sign of the times, when Blanche began racing, there hadn't yet been a black female athlete on the South African national team. And as Blanche makes reference to here, competing on the national level and being on the national team was the greatest goal for South African athletes at the time, because during apartheid, South Africans were banned from international competition. It was also a high achievement for a female runner because women's running in South Africa during this era was fiercely competitive, with Blanche going up against runners such as Colleen de Rook, Sonia Laxton, and Zola Budd. Note here, similar to how in the U.S., people might refer to getting on the national team as earning your stars and stripes, in South Africa, it's called earning or being awarded the springbok colors, or simply the colors, which are green and gold. The springbok, by the way, is a medium-sized antelope commonly found in South Africa, and it's the country's national animal. Um, yes, I did get a phone call from the national body, but also the provincial. My pro provincial athletic body also notified me and then I was um, invited to go to a function in Johannesburg to be awarded these colors. So it, uh, they've made, really, it was a big um, celebration. And um, yeah, and I think just every athlete's desire to wear the green and gold, um, because that, that, that was the, um, what do you call it? The, the real carrot, you know? the highest that we could get uh, achieve in, in South Africa at the time. So yes, Blanche earned her springbok colors, becoming the first melanin-enriched female to do so. And with that, her personal pursuits became firmly planted in the historical, social, and political landscape of South Africa. And where did she land in this conversation? Uh, the strange thing is that um, I've never... You know, I know a lot of people made a fuss about me the, being the first melanin in reach to receive the colors. But to me, it was just receiving those colors that was exciting. I just felt I've done it legitimately uh, on merit. It wasn't a token. Uh, my record spoke for themselves. My position, uh, my podium finishes uh, could attest to that. Um, so it was just such a satisfying moment. And that's when I knew that... Um, uh, I could compete with the best, you know, in my country. Well, it hadn't been Blanche's goal to make social and political history, she was certainly aware of what it meant. I accepted those with responsibility, a lot of the responsibility, knowing that I could go back to my community and say it's doable. Come on, ladies, you can do this. Let's get more of us on the running field. And over the years, we, we've had lots of our goals now are really dominating, um, you know, cross-country, um, 10Ks, and so forth. And, and, and that's really heartwarming. But she wasn't perhaps quite aware of how far the inspiration of her achievements was reaching. Blanche mentions Robben Island here, which, located off the west coast of South Africa, was home to a notoriously harsh prison. During apartheid, many black political prisoners were sent there, including former South African President Nelson Mandela and high-ranking politician Jeff Hadebe. Blanche also mentions former President Thabo Mbeki. The leadership that was in Robben Island at the time, I wasn't aware, they were aware of my running. But when they came out of Robben Island, I was informed by, uh, well, the minister, uh, Chef Hadebe first, when he met me, that when they were in Robben Island, I was an inspiration. They knew when I was doing so well that um, the, the change was imminent. And at a later stage, I met President Nelson Mandela and uh, 
uh, Tabumbeki at um, an award ceremony. And once again, they reiterated that I really brought joy. They, they were so excited when they saw me running that well. That was humbling because I wasn't aware. I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware they had TV in Drummond Island. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that was just such an accolade. So irrespective of the challenges I had, when I got that feedback, I knew that I had done okay. Appreciation for Blanche's achievements spread far and wide, and it especially extended deep into her local community. Also, I find humbling is that the laborer on the road. Every day I walk through my area, in my community, um, the guys picking up the refuse would come back and positive stuff and just say how much they appreciate what I'm doing and the little old lady will come. Oh, I've got to tell you this piece. I was in a, a supermarket one day and this elderly lady, well, I'm elderly, but she was much older, walked up to me, put a hand in her chest and, and she's dressed not very elegantly, not like a regular person. Uh, probably financially challenged, but she puts her hand in the breast, takes out two ren, hands it over to me and says, in the vernacular, Tanam, you do us proud, meaning, my child, you really are doing us proud. Now, to me, that was the greatest gift I could get, you know, from this lady. As Blanche remained focused on using her legs to make lemonade out of lemons, attitudes throughout the country did begin to shift. And over the years, um, I'm, I'm really happy to say I get support from every community, every, the Afrikaner, the English, the Zulu, the Sutu, the Kosa, the Pedi, every community in South Africa is behind me, and I appreciate that. Now, while Blanche had gained support in all the many provinces of South Africa, and she'd become an inspiration to people from many varied walks of life within her own immediate community and beyond. While she'd given hope to future world leaders and earned her place on the national team by being one of the best South African female runners of her time, in many distances, winning dozens of races and several national championship titles, breaking down racial barriers all along the way, while she'd done all of that, there was one glaring absence in Blanche's list of accomplishments. I'm a local girl, very local, yeah. Durban. Yeah. Comrades is, is a case of an event, the Durban event. And for many years I was doing well in middle distance, but people in my community <laughs> kept saying, you're not a runner until you do comrades. And I couldn't understand that. But now I can relate to what they were alluding to. What people are alluding to is that comrades has its own unparalleled significance, and it's difficult to explain. Promotional messaging for the race begins to capture what makes comrades so meaningful. This endurance event holds a very, very special place in many people's hearts. There really is something about the immense discipline, the meticulous planning, and the incredibly strong focus, gritty determination, and just sheer crazy perseverance that goes into pursuing a goal like running the comrades. And somehow it just stirs up that incredible human spirit. So now that Blanche has extensive experience with comrades, what has she come to understand about this must-run athlete-defining event? It's a challenge, all right? The distance is a challenge on its own, but there's so much of camaraderie around it. Uh, it it's humbling. It brings you down to, to, to what do you call it? Um, for want of a better word. Yeah, it, it humbles you. You have people from all walks of life running. Your scientists, your laborers, your professionals, and so forth. And all of them with one goal, to reach the finish line. And I think this is where you get the courage from. Every single person forgets their roots and their personal accomplishments in terms of profession and all that. 
you, you're just such a huge, big family running this distance. You've really, it, it's difficult to explain the, the phenomenon of, of comrades. You've got to run it to experience and to really understand what gets so many people coming back again and again to do this ultra marathon. You reach the 60k mark. You all are fatigued at that mark, whether you're the top runner or the back runner. What gets you through is mental toughness. Everyone will tell you that. So, and this is the beauty of it. This camaraderie that Blanche mentions, this was the intent of this event from the very beginning, way back almost a century ago. Comrades was founded by World War I veteran Vic Clapham to honor those who had been killed in that great war with an act of great mental and physical endurance. To quote the race's constitution, a primary goal of Comrades is to celebrate mankind's spirit over adversity, or I might add, womankind's spirit over adversity. The first Comrades took place on Tuesday, May 24th, 1921, and it has run every year since, except during World War II, from 1941 to 45. For that first race, 34 white men started and 16 finished. The first woman to run the race was Frances Hayward in 1923, and she clocked a respectable 11 hours, 35 minutes. However, at that time and until 1975, only white men were allowed to compete officially. So Hayward's finish, as well as the finishes of women and black men who ran the race before 1975, was unofficial. Omitting women from the sport and from long distance running in particular, of course, was not unique to comrades. For instance, the Olympic marathon has existed since 1896 for men, but there was no Olympic marathon for women until 1984. And the Boston Marathon started in 1897, but it wasn't open to women until 1972. It's worth noting here that when Comrades did open up to all competitors, male, female, white, black, this was firmly in the midst of apartheid, which began in 1948, and it didn't end until 1994. The fact that running can become so much more than a simple act of speeding up your steps, this is something Blanche has a strong appreciation for. That besides the competitive athlete, it was so important for me to impress on other women to run for leisure, run for social, run for health, because that also empowered them. You know, their health improved. Um, the because we have a very high um, gender-based violence in South Africa. That actually empowered a lot of the women to stand up and say enough is enough because they started having positive thoughts and about themselves, feeling good about themselves and just liberating. So my mission was not just to get the competitive athletes but just to get everybody else, social, health conscious, healthy living um, community. And Blanche continues to help remove the barriers that discourage women from running. One of the hurdles that many women from my community had was that there were a lot of myths surrounding sports women. Um, and one of them was that you wouldn't be able to conceive, um, your breasts would be droopy, um, you'd be, it would detract from your femininity. Those are really hard myths that the men actually generated, you know. And um, yeah, so we hope that all those will be yeah. Do those absolutely. still persist? In our rural areas, yes, we still have a bit of that. Um, we have areas where you still need permission from the chiefs in that area if a girl child has to participate in sport, not a boy child. And if a girl child has to travel out of the 
area to, to represent the province, you still need permission. So there is still a bit of that patriarchal. And the chief is always a man. Oh yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, oops, yeah, unfortunately that is. Blanche has witnessed firsthand, however, the way running can lift up women around her, the way her example and inspiration continues to have an impact. I've got a young girl. I've been working with her. She was 13. She's in her mid-30s now. And she's turned out, blossomed out to be one of our top provincial runners. Um, she's got her national colors as well. And she gives me feedback all the time about how my mentorship has empowered her. She also comes from a financially challenged family and community where there's still a lot of violence in that area. So it's, the challenges are, are there. Um, and yes, she was um, assaulted once. Um, so, you know, those were the challenges. But the feedback I get that yes, I was her, her strength. Blanche keeps running transforming very sour lemons into ever more nurturing lemonade. Well, my hope really is that every woman in South Africa should feel free and more safe in the environment they are in, to have more confidence that um, they can stand up for their rights. And I hope, I truly hope that the patriarchal societies we live in will be something obsolete one of these days. And um, that we should respect one another. And um, yes, girls can play sport too. This concludes Blanche's story. You can learn more about this episode or about Strides Forward by visiting stridesforwardpodcast.com. I recommend several resources on the website that are related to women and running. And each episode after the story, I choose one of those resources to highlight. The recommended resource for this episode is Women's Running Magazine. This publication touches on all aspects of the running lifestyle, from racing and training to nutrition, gear, and inspiration, as well as covering some of the competitive side of the sport, the runners, events, and news. And it includes writing by such award-winning journalists as Aaron Strout, who received the 2019 Excellence in Running Journalism Award from the Roadrunners Club of America. I encourage you to please stay in touch. You can reach me through the website, and I'm also active on Twitter under the name at Strides Forward. I welcome all feedback, questions, and community building efforts and suggestions. Thank you to Blanche Moila for sharing her story. Blanche was one of the few runners I've gotten to interview in person, and I'm really appreciative of her sitting down with me during an extremely busy time. I'm also thankful to her running club, the Savages Athletic Club, and in particular, Debbie Honeyset, for helping me get in touch with Blanche. Meeting Blanche was one of my most treasured experiences during my first time in South Africa, which was also my first time seeing the comrades in person. Thank you to April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative for the logo and website design. You can find April at bonfirecollaborative.com. And thank you to Cormac O'Regan for the original music and sound design. And definitely thank you, the listener. I am so grateful you're taking the time to listen to these stories about women runners. Please subscribe and share. And until next time, this is Cherie wishing you satisfying strides forward. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. 
We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.